story this week that really dominated out there. It was uh, Radio New Zealand. We tried to get the minister on. He was unavailable today. We tried to get Jim Mather, who is the chair mm. of the board at uh, Radio New Zealand, and the CEO. None of them would come on the programme to discuss what has been an editorial scandal engulfing a, a public entity. Is that good enough, Mark? You're a former news boss. Uh, no, it's not good enough at all. I think... Um Jim Mather should have been sitting here today um, explaining what this inquiry is going to involve, what questions they're asking and what they're going to do with the results, to particularly to build back trust um, for Radio New Zealand. Mm. Its trust has been hammered over this and so if I was the chairman I'd be in here showing I'm going to act. Um, no, I think, uh, I think they're I, I think maybe they're just, you know, maybe just running a little bit scared, just a bit scared of uh, interviews. But mm. when you take on those positions, you've got to front up. Yeah, and you've got to stand up for your journalists too, don't you? Totally. Uh, and your organisation. From a governance point of view, mm. how do you think this has been handled, Nathan? Uh, woefully. I can't believe that someone in RNZ was allowed to do this over five years. I found it ironic that Paul Thompson, the CEO, was being interviewed by his own people and not going out to the public to be scrutinised by their actions. Is it? There's no, the credibility, I agree with Mark, has been shot. Uh, I just think, where's the editorial uh, oversight on some of these stories? I think it's woeful at a time when AI might be around and people are thinking about where are the home truths. Here's our public broadcaster that can't even be truthful about what their message is that they're pushing out. So I'm really disappointed. I know that some of their viewers will be well rusted on, but uh, we need to have full visibility on what this inquiry is uh, going to be covering. And heads need to roll in RNZ. If I was the broadcasting minister, I would be publicly saying I'm really disappointed. I want the chair in my office. I want to hold RNZ to account. I want time frames. I want accountability because we just can't afford to have our public broadcaster actually being allowed to do the, what the, the, I, th I think, tell unfortunate mistruths to the New Zealand public at a time when we're screaming out for, for truthful stories, yeah. wanting to know what's happening with the war and, and the message is being manipulated. Yeah, it, it is such a fascinating and complex uh, situation that they're facing over there. One of the things I was really surprised to find out, and I think perhaps journalists at Radio New Zealand were too, was that the digital arm seemed to be completely separate from the news arm. Uh, had completely different processes in Peoplefin. Yeah, look, it's interesting. Like, I can't speak to the internal processes at RNZ too much, but I do think it speaks to something broader because the digital teams in a lot of newsrooms are in a lot of ways siloed from traditional broadcast because the needs of digital are different. What works on digital is a lot different. Digital journalists uh, are often aren't coming from a traditional broadcast background. And I think there is a bigger story here as well of the pressure on the industry is immense from an economic perspective, from a business perspective. But unfortunately, the brunt of that is often being borne by digital teams. Digital journalists are often paid a lot less money than traditional broadcasts. They're being asked to produce content at all hours of the day very, very quickly, and there often aren't those traditional guardrails or oversight around them. Yeah. So if there can be any learning that comes out of that from just this ruthlessly pragmatic perspective, it should be that newsrooms really need to invest and pay attention to their digital arms so this kind of thing isn't happening. Mark? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, good point, Finn, because... And Nathan has to take some responsibility for this, even though he was whacking him just a minute ago. His, oh, it's all my fault. No, you know, his, his government underfunded um, oh, Radio New Zealand. On, no, they did. They totally did. The what, current, so, so, the what, current, so suddenly think, it's the national government's issue for editorial oversight. It's no, rubbish. No, no. Here's, here's the thing, Nathan. This, this outfit, RNZ, has had 15 years of underfunding. This is what happens when you underfund an organisation for so long. The executives get exhausted, uh, the staff numbers are way down. In the end, you don't have oversight. And a mistake like this, a bad mistake like this happens. It, it's a consequence of it. And if you, if you want to deny it, that's fine. Well, they've had more um, funding. They've had, in recent times, they've had more funding. In the very and the, over recent the last times. five years, we've had the Labor government that put, yep. put more funding into RNZ. A little bit. So, so how can you justify your comments and blame no. it on the previous government? Because This is editorial oversight, yes. Mark, no. and it's been woeful. No, but you see, they've been run down so badly that the executives are running around putting out fires everywhere. Then they've been dealing with the floods. Um, they've been dealing with COVID. The organisation gets stretched yeah. beyond what is no. basically acceptable. Poor excuse. I'm not, no, it's not a poor excuse. It doesn't entirely excuse it, but it explains exactly. some of the reasons it happened. In fact, I want to um, talk, 